So here I am with uh, Dr. Drake Lee and, and Dr. Bruce Richards, and we're going to talk about their uh, recently available and published paper comparison of prepartum low energy or high energy diets with a chew diet far off and close up strategy for multiparous and premiparous cows. I'm Dr. Bruce Richards. I Presently, I am teaching at Delaware Valley University. I teach animal nutrition and I do some uh, student research projects with uh, the undergraduates. Uh, we do not have a graduate program in animal science or dairy science here. So I, my research is just with undergraduates. And uh, I also teach a Spanish for agriculture course. I got my PhD at the University of Illinois uh, when we did this research. And I uh, was uh, there while uh, Dr. Cardoso was also there as a graduate student and enjoyed working with him and also working with Dr. Drakeley. And uh, previous to that, I did my bachelor's and my master's degrees at Utah State University. I'm Dr. Jim Drakeley, a professor at the University of Illinois. I've been here for uh, 31 years, I think, so a while. <laughs> um, had a lot of good graduate students like these two gentlemen and, and uh, continue to enjoy to have a research program and, and teaching. We are all aware, and I think both of us work a little bit with this uh, topic of the, the control energy strategy. And, uh, you know, just for a starter, how, where did that idea uh, come from? So we'd been working with uh, the idea of, of um, trying to optimize the transition period for a number of years and had an, an experiment that we've uh, showed that, that cows that were fed a low energy diet supplemented with fat. So it was, it was higher in energy, but the base ingredients were low. Uh, that seemed to prevent fat accumulation in the liver um, and we tried to follow that up by trying to understand if it was the, the lower energy intake with that diet because dry matter intake was, was decreased, uh, or was it the fat content? And in subsequent experiments, we showed that it was not the fat content, that it was probably the, the lower energy intake that was responsible for that finding. Um, and so the since we didn't want to advocate restricting cows, which is really hard to do on farms where you have group feeding and, and so on, um, we, we started working with higher bulk diets, um, high fibrous diets, so that we would reduce the energy content while still filling the cows up. Um, and so we'd, we had another graduate student that kind of developed that, that line of, of research. And then the, the, um, the critical question became, is this, can we do this as a single diet or is it still better to have a close-up diet? And that's where, where Bruce came in. So um, Bruce, maybe you can pick it up from there. Sure. Uh, so uh, our research this specifically for this article looked at uh, comparing a, a two-stage two system to a controlled energy diet throughout the entire dry period. Uh, common practice in, on dairy farms is to feed the two-stage system with a lower energy diet uh, for the first uh, early lactation. Uh, we used 40 days. Uh, and then uh, what was some, sometimes called a steam up, steam up diet or a close up diet as uh, partrition closes or for our research, we used the last 20 days of the dry period. But however, there's not a lot of research to support that uh, strategy to, to feeding. And when you do that, you also have to have two pens of dry cows, which can present a problem for some dairy farmers uh, to, to, on the small to medium sized dairy farms. And so uh, we, we looked at, is there really any uh, value to having that, that two stage feeding system or is it more valuable to just feed a controlled energy diet throughout the whole dry period? We also used a negative control of uh, feeding the, uh, the tip, a diet that was represented the typical steam up diet throughout the entire dry period and uh, comparing then the controlled energy high fiber diet 
to the uh, higher energy diet, uh, and then comparing that to the two-stage system. Uh, and when I say controlled energy high fiber, I mean what's in the published as the low diet in the in the research article. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, you know, the naming and the the branding is something that you know. Uh, changes a little bit like you just saw I just saw some papers and actually I can put a link here a sequence of papers three papers from uh, Trevor De Vries group in Guelph when he's talking about the particle size of the straw but he's yeah. talking about the high straw diet uh, yeah. so I've seen high straw diets contour energy diets uh, low energy diets right uh, and he also saw, uh, mentioned something about the dry matter he did a research on that and then he added molasses to one of those trials and check uh, room and environment and everything. So pretty much that sequence of papers is, I would say is the, first, the top questions that probably Dr. Drickley has when he's talking about the control energy diet, about sorting, you know, particle size is huge important. Mm -hmm. So they address that in a paper. So scientifically we could answer that. Then they talk about the dry matter is not a big deal, you know, that you, Probably you had, to, did you have to add water to that diet, Bruce? Do you remember? Yes. Yep. Yeah. We added water. To, to try to bring that up. And he's doing that and adding sugar with the, the molasses. So the very uh, interesting sequence of papers. Yeah. So one thing is just to clarify then. So you had a low energy and any uh, uh, reasons why you guys work with megajoules? Is that something now that JDS is requiring or is just the British in you uh, or uh, Scottish or whatever? <laughs> that was a, a reviewer that was pretty adamant that we should be using the the SI units. So because probably most, <laughs> at least most <laughs> people here in the US, they did what I do and converted yeah. back. Right. So I think for right. us, it's going to be 134 megacal uh, of net energy lactation uh, of dry matter for the low and 160 mega cow for the high. Yeah. That's what I got. Yep. So you fed from 60 days before Kevin to Kevin 134 low energy. Then you did the same thing with the high uh, 160, right? Um, uh, mega, uh, mega cow Yo, yeah. right now per kilo of dry matter. And then you did, then you did low high. Right. So pretty much you have two diets before calving and you feed the whole time or you feed low, far off, and then high, uh, close, up. close up. And then the question is, of course, didn't you think about having also the high low? <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't really think about right? that. Uh -huh. yeah, it would have been, would have been nice, but, uh, resources get pretty thin when you start at getting that many treatments and cows. I see. But, but I yeah, we didn't need to be running that experiment any longer than we ran it. <laughs> <laughs> One year to get that many cows through, it was plenty. Yeah, th that's something that I want to touch base also is that uh, not often we have primipers cows on trials. So it, it was good to, to see that. But also I know that brings a little bit of... Uh, work on interpretation, especially on the milk side of things, right? When you are trying to do right. diet effects, oh, but hey, wait, I have to include this parity here in my model to kind of try to make those two different, right? Uh, right, right. But I think it was valuable to have the, the heifers in there as well to, to show that the results were similar between the cows and the heifers. Yeah. So was, was it a reason to make a number of cows or you guys were really thinking that that primiparous cows, they would have a different requirement. Did you expect, for example, that the heifers or the first lactation to be, they would perform differently than the multiparous? Let's say maybe heifers, they would need the high energy and cows would be okay with the low energy. Was that a question that you guys have or got I that I think it was, uh, it was a question that, that people had quite often in the field is, well, what do we do with heifers if we have them running in the same group as the older cows? So that was, it was valuable to look at it, I think. And you could, you could think about it both ways that the heifers would do, um, that they needed the higher energy diet or that they would do better on the low energy diet because it was more similar to, to what they were coming off of. So it was, it was really hard to make a, 
a guess, a hypothesis, how they would behave on the, on the different diets. So I think one big take, and correct me if I'm wrong, but one big take would be, hey, if you want to feed the whole dry period, a low energy diet, that probably would be beneficial to those cows. Correct. Yeah. You would not need a far off plus close up. No, That's and I think what that, our research indicated. Yeah. And I, I think that, um, you know, for herds that are, are smaller or midsize, they may find that that's a, a better option for them instead of trying to make a real small group or two, two small groups. So I think that's one big take that we get those questions, right? Do I need far off a close up? Say, no, just go the whole dry period yeah. with that uh, low energy diet. You should be fine. So I think that, you know, we have to, we probably should qualify that a little bit and say, you know, under the conditions of our farm and the production level of our cows, which is, which is moderate. They're not, we, we don't have the highest production compared to a lot of uh, our best farms in the field, but um, under those conditions, there was really no advantage that we could show from having the, from having the close up diet. Day to day feeding Bruce, uh, like for example, making sure we know particle size is important. Uh, what are the things that you, you remember being involved with the research to make sure those diets were delivered the correct way or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so good question. Of course we did, uh, we used the Penn State particle separator weekly for, uh, for both the uh, low diet and the high diet and then also the lactation diet, all three diets, we did use the particle separator uh, every week. So when I teach that to my nutrition students now, I always make them do the shaking because I tell them I did plenty of shaking when I was in graduate school. Uh, and then uh, we also, with the low energy diet, uh, as stated in the uh, research article, we used a Keenan mixer wagon uh, to, to chop the straw down. And so we had a procedure uh, where we uh, would put the straw in and then we put the corn silage and heavier feed on top of that to kind of we, we had a little bit of issue getting the, the, the straw chopped to begin with till we figured out the right mixing order to kind of hold that straw down on the blades and uh, get it chopped down uh, to the right particle size to, to avoid sorting in the cows. And as, as you mentioned, we also added water uh, to, to get the right uh, moisture content. Yeah, so I think monitoring dry matter of the ingredients so that we have, you have the right proportions in the TMR and, and uh, monitoring the, the chopping of the straw is, is pretty critical. And just maybe a funny story. I still have a picture of when we, we took an old flip phone and compared it to the particle size, like we, <laughs> we took a picture of the particle size of the straw and compared it to a yeah. flip phone. Now I have to explain to people what that is. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I have a newer picture with a, uh, an Android phone in it. So then those cows calved, right? And then another thing that was kind of, I think people were really interested in is, okay, you are limiting or, right, the energy concentration of the diet of these cows. Now they're gonna calve, they are just not gonna produce milk, right? Or milk is gonna be lower than the steam up diet. Uh, so you guys, didn't see that with milk yield at least, right? No. Right, so milk yield was the same across the dietary treatments. Uh, we did see a higher level of fat corrected milk because the cows on the high energy diet had higher uh, fat in their milk. Uh, our theory or explanation for that is that uh, those cows, and it's also supported by the level of non-esterified fatty acids and BHBA, that uh, those cows were being overfed energy during the dry period. And then once they calved, they started using body reserves to meet their energy requirements, started uh, turning adipose tissue into NEFAs, non-esterified fatty acids. And uh, because of that, that was then showing up in their milk. So they had higher milk fat content. And uh, then, uh, so, so consequently higher fat corrected milk, but that would be a short-term gain, uh, but not a long-term benefit as those cows are in, in, that indicates that the cows are in negative energy balance during that time. 
Yeah, and I think on the, the lactation side, you guys provide a uh, resource here that it, you talk about the energy balance. So you, you talk about the energy balance in megajoules again, but you also have as a percentage of the requirement. Uh, and interesting enough, it's like a, it's almost like a flip-flop, right? Uh, where you have the cows in low at 94% after calving, cows in high at 80%, so they were in more negative energy balance. And then you have the low high uh, at 86. So the, uh, and they're all different from each other statistically. Mm -hmm. right? So it seems like the bad deal is having the whole dry period in that high diet. Yeah. You avoid it a little bit. So that also shows that your far off kind of impacts your results after because uh, if you had a high in there, you would damage much more than negative energy balance. Uh, or how can I say? Yeah. It limited the effect of the high just having into the, the three weeks, but only yeah. that three weeks already affects something. Yeah. I think that's interesting put in that way where your low energy, you are at 92% far off and 93%. So you pretty kept consistent that percentage of the requirement mm -hmm. for energy. Mm -hmm. And the high, you were at 149 and dropped to 128. Probably intake dropped a little bit, right? And then the low high, you went from 83 to uh, 119. So it's clear, anytime you have high, you have higher energy than what is uh, required, right? Uh, so why, if 96, why do we call low energy? So is 92 saying that is too low or is that close enough to 100% that you think you are just giving what the cow needed and not restricting energy? Yeah. I think it, would, it refers to the energy density of the diet. So the the low diet or lower energy diet was lower in energy density than the high energy diet. But you're, you're absolutely right that what the cow ends up eating in terms of mega calories per day is the real, the real driving factor there. It's not the, the energy density, but we have the kind of the, 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 the um, counterpoint there of the energy density and dry matter intake so as the cows uh, have higher energy density diets, they also eat more. And so the total energy intake is, is increased much more than just the, the dietary content. To the point where you are diluting the energy of that diet, right. let's say, right? Uh, right? So lower energy density for that TMR for low. Uh, however, in your strategy of using straw to limit that intake, you end up and that was caught up here uh, statistically that the intake of those cows is lower. Yep. So you had a lower intake during the close-up, for example. And well, that happened at far off as well on the same way, right? Uh, but the close-up shows clearly that the uh, low had a lower intake than the two other treatments that had high in the close-up, right? So I, I think at the same time, so roughly 10 kilos versus 12 kilos. Uh, so that also means that, okay, you are diluting the energy, but perhaps you should be concentrating something else. Th does that make sense or no? Mm. So if, if I want to, for example, to give the same or the correct amount of minerals that are required or vitamins or on the protein side as well, then I have to be worried about, hey, my cows are going to eat less. And, and I wonder if that's something that also happened in commercial farms where perhaps intake, intake is even more challenged with um, overcrowding and, and other, you know, environmental factors. If that's something that doesn't get taken care of. I think you may be right. I mean, you have to remember that we want the, the, whole diet to be balanced in terms of what the cow needs for protein and minerals and vitamins. So um, it, it, um, we have to be formulating the diet accounting for the lower energy, but um, having enough protein supplied. You're, you're right there. Yeah. Because I, I'm thinking, you know, if I'm formulating a diet on AMTS or NRC uh, and it's predicting that my cow is going to eat 
12 kilos per day. Yeah. If I'm start changing, if I'm not cautious about looking at other items, uh, and it could be FDN as a percentage of body weight, but my motto itself is not going to adjust to a lower intake, if that makes sense. My motto is not yeah. automatically change. No, no, now your cow is only going to eat 10 kilos. Right. Make sure you adjust everything else. I think it it's on the nutritionist to have other hints or indicators on yeah. how that's going to affect. Yeah, and I think the... Uh, the the intake predictions with AMTS or or other models are not very accurate for when we're dealing with this these higher NDF diets, higher bulk diets. So that is a, an important point. The cows, I guess, will always tell you the right answer. You just have to to listen to what they're telling you. That's a good point, and, yeah. and hopefully they always speak the same language all over the world. <laughs> I've heard yeah. in some places they speak different. I think so. <laughs> but, but, but actually, that could be something. And I'm not sure, uh, Jim, I think you already mentioned something about it to get some of this whole data set and work with uh, Tom to look. I think you, you had something yeah. in your mind and say, hey, uh, can, can we predict that whenever you have yeah. this high inclusion of straw or NDF or UNDF 240, wherever we want right. to? classify how is that modeling intake right yeah we were going to do that and, and somehow um it got sidetracked so that remains for some good student to do i think <laughs> some of those things is it, it's very hard to answer in a heartbeat so for example if people ask me uh can i feed an ionic diet the whole dry period i already get scared of answering because uh what is an ionic diet i i need mm. a better definition what it is and almost like a control energy diet, you really need a really yeah. good definition what people are talking about. So you can, right. Some people think if they put, you know, a pound or two of straw into their ration, then they're feeding a, a controlled energy or a high straw diet. And that's, that's not going to do it. So it, it's like everything else, you know, if, uh, once it starts to be implemented, then people start tinkering with it. Farmers and nutritionists right. are great tinkerers and, they start changing things. And, and so you have a wide variety of, of different scenarios that end up being called controlled energy when they, when I probably would look at it and say, no, these are, you're not controlling the energy your your cows are still consuming too much energy. Is there anything that uh, you guys would do differently on that diet compared to today? Cause I noticed that in the paper you mentioned, I'd say whenever the cow calved for a period of, 10 days, you offered um, a little bit of alfalfa hay for them. W yeah. w was that something that they were after, Bruce? Do you remember? Do they really enjoy that little alfalfa? Or more like a practice and a feel good type of feeling that you had? Uh, yeah, it was more like a make the farm manager happy type thing. <laughs> uh, they, 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 when we were measured refusals, it seemed like there was quite a bit of the alfalfa hay still left in the refusals. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's one thing we would probably do away with. And um, I, I think if we look at our diets now, I would say that the high diet was, was probably too high in energy density for a, a close-up diet. And so maybe we'd, we'd look at lowering the energy density a, a bit on that high diet to make the comparison. As of today, are there other things that you consider on those diets? Uh, for, for example, not just making sure you get the amount of fiber to uh, limit the intake and that energy density, but do you look more critically today on uh, other items, soluble fiber, sugar, protein, amino acids? I, th I think that's something that really changed from yeah. from that diet to, to pay more attention. If I look into the milk protein from your cows at that time, and I think that was reflected through the herd. It's not something different than we were having at the herd. Right. I don't remember. I don't think we were feeding amino acids at that time. No, right? no. We right. Weren't. And we were at 290, no, 263, 270, 274 milk yeah. protein for those uh, weeks. And Today, our farm, we can perform better, but I, I think it's just a different strategy. Yeah. 
Yeah, certainly the the amino acid supplementation or the uh, metabolizable protein, metabolizable amino acids uh, side is something that we are looking more closely at now than we did a few years ago when Bruce did the study. And also trying to, uh, that that's one of the things we mentioned in the paper was making, possibly making the protein more similar between the, across the diets yeah. as well. So the, the, the protein, the protein, if you look at the protein level of the low diet versus the high diet, mm. they're, they're not the same. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're talking about. You're talking about 12 versus 14 yeah. percent crude protein. And then lactation, you are at 16.9 crude protein. There was a, a study done at Cornell. Study was actually done after ours, but they published before we did, um, where they did a similar set of treatments, the three treatments, but had to equalize the metabolizable protein supply across the three diets, which I think is a um, that was a strong point of their study. Yeah, I think that was Sabine, right? Yes. Yeah. Man, and I think yeah. I, ha I have the slides here. And I think that was 2015. Yeah. We're actually, yeah. Uh, the findings were very similar. Very similar. Yeah. Very similar uh, on that fat percentage increase and that fat corrected milk being increased in the, the high. They call it right. control, intermediate, and high. I think another thing that we might do differently is is uh, use an anionic salt program or manage the the decad. We um, we were using the partial decad idea where you you um, drop the decad somewhat, but closer to zero rather than going negative. Right, and that might be something else too to look at. Is is that period right before calving like? We, maybe a follow-up research project would be to look at if you could figure out how to feed them just a kind of a close-up diet for a week before calving the problem with that of course is cows don't always follow the books or the rules and they mm -hmm. don't always calve on their due date and so trying to figure out exactly when seven days pre-calving is, is is more difficult of course it was even a challenge with 20 days but at least there you have more uh, room for for error yeah so the 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 second big point then on the primiparous. So is the conclusion that they go, they do well in that low as well? And on the other hand, that they kind of get hammered on the high as well? Yeah, the results were similar between primiparous and multiparous cows. And so they they did well on the, the low energy diet and, and uh, had had some of the same issues on the high energy diet. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking for uh, parity by diet interactions and uh, there's nothing here. Not very many, right? No. On the, the milk uh, yield and, and everything else. Yeah. Well, maybe even that new protein be a little bit lower. That's kind of, I'm not used to see primiparous, primiparous with that group. So that, that per se already makes it a little bit lower perhaps, right? Yeah. I, th I think one of the really interesting parts of the study to me, well, actually uh, two that are probably related, but uh, one was the, how the cows responded in intake once they were switched to the high diet from the low diet. They went up over a period of about a week to the same level of intake as the cows that were on the high diet the whole time. And then they started following them down, decreasing intake towards calving, just as the, the group that had been on the high diet all along. So I, I, that's, that's an interesting uh, finding, I think, from looking at intake control during the, the close-up period. And uh, Sabine Mann also showed that same response. And then the other thing is, you mentioned it before, Phil, was uh, uh, that the the shorter time period on the high diet, so just the, the two group system where they were switched to the high diet for three weeks, they were kind of intermediate on everything in terms of their metabolism. So they had uh, NEFA concentrations that were intermediate and BHBA that was intermediate and liver fat that was intermediate between the low and the high group. 
So just that three week period of feeding the high energy diet was enough to, um, to shift the metabolism part way towards the, the overfed group. One thing we haven't emphasized is, is those uh, liver lipid results, the, the le levels of lipid in the liver, especially uh, uh, postpartum, the, the, the difference between the low energy cows and the high energy cows uh, is remarkable. Uh, and I want to mention David Beaver here. He was one of our collaborators uh, that, that worked with us as well. And uh, when, when he saw results for the liver total lipid, he, he, he said we were going to win the Nobel Peace Prize. I, I guess that goes to Donald Trump <laughs> this year, but, uh, <laughs> hey, I, but it, it, it is pretty remarkable how, how the low energy diet re decreased the liver total lipid. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the two group system were, were intermediate. They went up, but not as far as the, the high group. So we still see when we finish at day 30 that you guys collected those uh, biopsies, right? Uh, the liver, uh, uh, lipid, total lipid, or triacylglycerol, whatever, they were on the same pattern. Yeah. When, when do you guys think that gets to the same amount? Or, for example, if you stretched your research from uh, the 40 days to 80 days or 100 days, you think there is a moment where, okay, now everything is normal again, or that gets translated to the whole lactation where you need another lactation to kind of fix that metabolically or? Hmm. Another great question. Yeah, I, all I can say is from our, uh, from other studies that we've done, we, we don't have that titrated very closely, but if you go to, we, we had several studies that measured liver composition again at day 60 or 65 and by that time they're almost always back to the the same as the the other groups so i would say somewhere between 30 and and 60 days but uh, it's a an unanswered question how long that would take i guess you see differences in body condition score but i'm imagining that the range that you have there it's not that big right maybe two eight to three 35 or something like that. Yeah, so you probably. don't see fat cows or skinny cows going through this uh, system at, at least no. uh, in, in a that you design for it, right? Or right. It would be nice to be able to do a study and look at that with groups of large enough groups of high and low body condition score as well as intermediate. Yeah, because based on your other work from 2014, even though if we didn't capture that difference in body condition score or that little 2.8 to 3.25 or 335, that is kind of the range you have here in your mm -hmm. LS means, that doesn't mean that the visceral fat is not changing dramatically, right? That's right. Uh, right. So I think that's a, a, a huge uh, wake-up call type of deal on how this extra energy may be impacting the cow, not just do you know farmers feeding this type of diet or what's the yeah. reality here? You're trying to convince them from a different strategy. What, what's common in your side of the country? So a cool story. I, when I had started working here, I'd been here probably a year and I took my students out on a field trip to a dairy farm uh, out in Lebanon County, uh, 800 cow dairy farm. And uh, we were walking around the farm and we went by their dry manger and I noticed that they were feeding a uh, diet that had a lot of straw in it. And so I asked uh, the farm manager uh, how long he'd been feeding it and asked him about it. And he said that uh, they'd switched to that diet about a year earlier. And uh, he said that, uh, that they, it had come from a recommendation from their veterinarian, actually. And uh, when they switched to that diet, before they'd been feeding that diet to their dry cows, they'd had about 12 displaced abomasums a month. And when they switched to that uh, diet, they reduced their incidence of DAs down to about one a month by, by making that, that change in the diet. So uh, that was pretty cool and exciting for me when, when he made that. And of course, we uh, in our research, we didn't look specifically at displaced abomasums, but it has been shown that uh, they're linked when, when you have a fatty liver and other incidents of uh, met metabolic disorders, it increases the likelihood of another one occurring. And uh, 
Again, we didn't have the numbers to show that we decreased displaced abomasins, but that's another thing the straw does is it takes a long time for it to digest. It stays in that rumen. And so when they go through partrition, it helps keep the rumen full and helps keep that abomasin from floating up and twisting. So anyway, yes, there are dairy farmers that I've seen feeding it and uh, they've had some great success with it. And it's pretty exciting. Anything guys that I didn't cover or you guys would like to, to talk about this specific paper or anything associated with it? I it was... A great experience for me, a good, good educational opportunity for me. And uh, I, it's, I use it as an example for my students in my nutrition class. I, I talk about it every semester. And so it, 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 it was a really good learning experience for me and I'm uh, proud of it. And I'm, I was excited to see that it was the uh, editor's uh, choice for nutrition on, on the journal Dairy Science for October. So. Uh, it might not be the Nobel Peace Prize, but that's pretty good. <laughs> Probably as close as we'll get, Bruce. Probably. <laughs> no, I think that we've, we've covered most everything, Phil. Thank you very much for your time. You guys were very uh, generous with your time. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Phil. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Mm -hmm.